All right, we're talking to John Worthen, who was involved uh, in the beginning, or not in the beginning, with Ovanos in the 70s, I believe, John? Yes, early 70s. And, and uh, you know, he's agreed to tell his, his story. He's told me a little bit about it, and it's pretty exciting and scary. And, and uh, <laughs> But first off, before you get into that, John, how, and I guess part of that getting into it will be how did you get uh, with the Noss family in the beginning, but how did you get in interested in treasure hunting? Was Oba Noss the first part of it, or just kind of tell me your story? Well, we uh, I've always been in the mining business, and in the mining business, you're always looking for old mines, and naturally, treasure always comes as part of the history of many of these mines. And I was particularly interested in the seven cities of Cibola. And we had actually a mining claim in Nevada, which uh, had Spanish ingots uncovered on the property. And we determined that they were dated properly to perhaps be one of the seven cities of Cibola. So you did find some? We found ingots, yes. And this is different than the... This is altogether different than the Victoria Peak adventure. The uh, Many years ago I ran into a number of men, one George Duke, uh, another uh, gentleman was Marvin Beckwith, and Marvin Beckwith I learned uh, from him a bit about the NOS story, and Marvin was a securities stock hustler, and I was also a a penny stock hustler during those days and so we compared notes and I decided that his story might have some validity and this is after spending some time chasing the, uh, the 1947 publications uh, in the newspaper about the uh, Doc Noss story and uh, it was uh, some time after, after uh, meeting Marvin that uh, I started to believe in the story. And I spoke to Ovanas and flew. So, so I just want to stop you for a minute. Uh, Marvin, he was uh, Ova's uh, son, right? Stepson. Stepson. Ova's yeah. stepson, and he's the one that... Uh, that uh, was in the airplane crash when yes. Doc Noss was going, okay. And as long as I knew him, he still had a limp from it. And uh, I met with Ova, and she told me some glowing stories, and Dorothy, and uh, uh, Leila, or Layla Noss, the two uh, daughters, they told me corroborating stories, and they were full of sound and fury. I, I was able to see a few artifacts, but not test them or do much about it. The history uh, uh, really enamored me. And, and I went to Canada to meet Marvin's brother, Harold, who was the more or less the patriarch of the family. And I negotiated with Harold on behalf of Ova and the girls, a contract to acquire rights to the purported treasure trove on Victoria Island, or Victoria Peak. Once that was done, I paid them $90,000 cash, which was a lot of money in, yeah. in the early 70s. That's I, a lot of money now, but that, in the <laughs> 70s, that was a really a lot of right. money. I, I borrowed that money from a bank in Denton, Texas. And, uh, and George Duke, uh, who worked for me, helped arrange that loan. And it was to be secured with the contract. And the contract was to be, to be recorded in New Mexico. Uh, and as far as I know, it never was because the Nazis were to record it. And they had trepidation because of their fear the government, the state government, would take the treasure if they claimed it, or at least take a big portion of it. So my contract 
uh, sat in limbo for many years. During that period, we elected to try to uncover some of the purported ingots buried by Doc Noss and others from the uh, treasure trove. And to do that, it entailed sending people into the White Sands Missile Base, which uh, was very unfriendly to visitors. They had to sneak in. Yeah. And we actually arranged to have mules uh, go in, and then we'd walk beside the mules to go in to try to locate these this treasure. I had a, another uh, associate and employee named Ken Burns, who was in charge of that particular adventure, which was to get to the peak, either get in or find some of the ingots so we could offset the capital that we'd expended to get in the game and hopefully to make a profit. During, uh, during the next uh, few years, we had uh, uh, many experiences with the Secret Service, and this uh, it was well known that we were after bullion, and bullion was uh, certainly against the law to own before 1976, I believe, when Nixon uh, made it uh, legal. And so the uh, Secret Service of the and the Treasury Department were both, I think very interested in what we were trying to do. The, uh, uh, we had a number of experiences uh, that uh, established that they were investigating what we were doing. And it's still my contention that if we could uh, secure under freedom of information uh, from not only the FBI but moreover the Secret Service, who was responsible for, for the Treasury Gold uh, investigation? I think we would uncover some interesting things about the Knots' uh, purported treasure. Uh, during this period of time, it was obvious from talking to a number of people involved that the treasure most likely had been taken out of the uh, uh, Victorial Peak and and uh, dispersed to points unknown. We learned that the military, some of the military people were purportedly involved in an excavation that uh, removed some things from there and, and the story was that they were disseminated to the Bahamas as well as uh, Texas. Uh, the people whose names were associated with those was a, a uh, lieutenant, Fenneman or Fiedemann, something like that. I've got it written down somewhere, as well as some agents uh, representing uh, uh, President Johnson. And uh, we were unable to follow these threads to uh, an effective conclusion. However, during this period of time, I was acquiring a bank called the Atlantic Pacific Bank and Trust in Nassau, Bahamas, and learned from the banking community there that they had, in fact, received a large uh, shipment of gold bullion on two occasions, which was placed in the vaults of another bank, not the Atlantic Pacific Bank that I was buying. And I attempted to determine uh, the ownership of that uh, bullion and was never able to, to uh, really determine that. And I was asked to actually leave the island. And uh, I left on very hurried circumstances. So, so when, when, when you was uh, inquiring of that, they decided they didn't like you doing that and they asked you to leave? Is that They, they asked wow. me to leave. Yes, they did. Wow. And, uh, and I left without completing my purchase of the bank and the bank ultimately fell into the hands of the prime minister and he ended up owning it. But I was given uh, 24 hours to leave the island. Wow. 
later on, uh, uh, I had uh, been convicted of some securities violations and went to uh, prison. And, and I went to uh, uh, a prison in uh, Tacoma, Washington, a federal institution. And while there, uh, I became aware that that uh, F. Lee Bailey and some other people had received permission from the government to do a quick dig on the property. And I tried to, uh, I had earlier communicated with F. Lee Bailey about the treasure trove. But once I was in prison, he never responded to any of my queries. But I learned from the newspaper reports from McNeil Island, which is the penitentiary I, I was uh, doing time in, that they had in fact attempted to make a small excavation and the clock had run out and they were summarily sent off the reservation, meaning the White Sands Missile Reservation. Uh, what I think we should do now as a matter of interest is have Ken Burns come on board and tell you more about his truth and consequences experiences when he was in Socorro, which is also known as truth and consequences, attempting to recover some of the gold and some of the people he met and the stories that he shared with me. I wanted to mention that when we negotiated the contract with the Mosses, part of the uh, consideration, in addition to the money, was that I would take them to Disneyland. Ova, Lola, and Dorothy. Letha, Letha. Letha, yeah. Ova, Letha, and Dorothy had never been to Disneyland. And they lived in Socorro, which is Truth and Consequences, which is a hot, miserable, dry, dusty, horrible place. <laughs> and I just, when I met these people, they were all, let's say, full-sized humans. And I just uh, felt a lot of empathy as a young man. And I said, hey, I want to bring some, some fun into their life. And I love Disneyland, so... That became part and parcel of the consideration that I would take them on a trip to Disneyland. That's awesome. So I did. I got them loaded up, and uh, uh, they rented a car and drove to uh, Anaheim, and we spent a week uh, at Disneyland, and they had the time of their life. It awesome. Was, it was just a bunch of little kids who were, who were all grown-up women just with bright eyes, and it was the it was the highlight of my year that year, seeing the joy that I brought to those women by taking them to Disneyland. Awesome! It was a fun, fun trip. <laughs> it was. Cool. And now I'd like to get a hold of Ken Burns for us. Ken, if you recall, is a gentleman who worked for me, and he spent time and time and time in. Socorro and surrounding areas on this project and and he worked for me for a number of years while this went on and he, he uh, would report to me regularly with with uh, his findings and rather than clutter it I'll bring uh, him on now we're older we're less worried about the legal entanglements of violating the law, which we certainly were guilty of, uh, selling bullion, trying to get bullion, and conspiring to defeat the government of the United States on its own reservation. So we, we uh, certainly committed a number of offenses, and I feel now that at our age it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope Ken is of the same mind. We'll see what he has to say. Hello, hello. Ken Burns, John Rubin. Uh, I'll be darned. Yes, hey, I'm here with Terry Carter, 
who's a uh, gentleman interested in the NOS treasure trove story. And because we were certainly a principal and deeply involved years ago, they've forgotten us, of course, but uh, we want to share part of our story with Terry. Terry is, uh, he's got probably six or seven uh, uh, video clips that run up to two hours having to do with this project. He's really a student of it. So he wants to fill in the blanks. And I told him basically, you know, that we had a contract with the NASA's for the treasure trove and that your responsibility on that was to go to Truth and Consequences and try to find some gold to offset our costs and try to make us rich. <laughs> so, 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 Ken, thanks for thanks for talking with us. But uh, yeah, you know, you guys, the story is not known. There's a lot of story known about you know when Doc Noss found it up till the time he was shot and then and, and killed, and then from the time that that uh, uh, Norman Scott got on to the property with the F. Lee Bailey. And then, when, and then another time when Terry Delonis um, headed up and got on the property again. You know, that part is known, but yours and John's story isn't known about at all. So, man, I just want to capture that history. <laughs> okay, well, I never got onto the peak itself, but I've talked to, talked to people who have, as you well know, John. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I told uh, as I told Terry, I think the the uh, statute of limitations is probably expired, and at our age, it doesn't matter. So, even though we violated the law a little bit, I think we can probably talk about it today. Well, he's he's a little bit sorry I'd there. Be, I'd be glad to if I can lend any light on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell us tell tell us, uh, Ken, what you learned and. And maybe you want to uh, reach out and and tell us uh, uh, what you found, if anything, and tell us about Herman Philpot and uh, any of the other desert rats you've run across. Well, I don't remember too much. I've had three strokes. And oh. A little bit slow on the memory. Okay, well, well do the best you can. I'm, I'm a, probably equally slow. Well, didn't Nas have a daughter? Yeah, Nas had uh, two daughters, Layla or Letha. Letha, yeah, Letha and Dorothy. And, and yeah, I meant Nas's I meant name was Ova. One of them. Yeah, and Ova was. Uh, the lady. Yeah. And they lived in that trailer in uh, Truth and Consequences. Right. I went there. I know you did. And they showed you some stuff they claimed came from the treasure trove. That's right. What did they show you, Kate? No. <laughs> Oma claims that she had been there. They had, uh, I don't know what you call it, I called it a nugget of some sort of metal. It looks like, looked like gold, but it looked like it was poured in a gourd. So it was a big nugget type thing then, huh? Yes. You know, what, what 10 pounds, 20 pounds, what, approximately? Ten pound. Okay. Now her brother claims. Don't know if you found him or anything. Tell you about Marvin Beckwith. He's, yeah. He's he's passed away. Marvin died. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah we knew Marvin well. I knew him very well. And Harold. Well, I, he, I don't think he, you ever met Harold. Well, that was Marvin's brother who no. lived in Winnipeg. But I flew up to Winnipeg, if you recall, and met with them to consummate the contract. You know, Marvin lived or ran around with, and 
and was friends with my ex-wife. Ah. That's definitely, definitely correct. And, and Lorraine uh, knew Marvin very well, as Jerry did. Yeah. And they could probably fill you in a lot more about him. Yeah. yeah we, I don't think we need uh, a lot about him. What we're looking for is what uh, what Ova may have shown you and some of the stories of uh, the guys going in into the missile base looking for the, the uh, tr treasure and the, uh, the stuff that Doc Moss purportedly buried on his way out. Well, I don't know that anybody's ever found any of that, but as you recall, Marvin claimed, claimed that Somebody from the missile base got in there ahead of him and remo removed everything. Uh huh. Now, old Herman Philpott claimed the same thing. What else did you learn from Herman? We used to give him money, remember? Yeah. Uh, Herman took me around through uh, the hinterland of New Mexico for three, two or three days blindfolded and took me into a cave that had some breastplate plates and paraphernalia and a whole bunch of uh, gourd-type gold, as she called it. So you, you physically got to see that, then? He took you in blindfolded, and you physically seen that? Yes. When we went in the cave, he took the blindfold off of me. Did he say anything about it, how he found it, or what he thought the history of it was, or...? or uh, anything like that, and this was still at the time when you couldn't own gold? No, I think you could, that was a little after that. Where did he say it uh, came from? The cave, whose cave was it? It was, was the Forest Service property. Okay. So was you guys having some kind of an agreement with him on them bars and stuff, the breastplates, or did you do anything with that? Or Well, uh, Ken had an, a number of deals with this guy, as I recall. Yeah. And, and many of the deals, he, he was supposed to furnish some ingots. Right. And Ken, do you recall we got one ingot? Which we, I thought we did. Yeah, we did. I used it as a doorstop for three years. <laughs> okay. Remember, remember the old uh, governor mansion I lived in by the mall? That was my doorstop, and nobody ever even noticed what it was. <laughs> That's one way to hide it right up inside. Yeah, that was, <laughs> it was there for three years, yeah. Well, John, remember one night we flew down there. I do. We tried to Richard retain. Day went with us. Who? Wasn't it Richard Day one of the guys that went with us? I think so. One of the I brought one of the attorneys. Yeah. I think it was Richard. And we flew down there. We were supposed to pick up some ingots, weren't we? Yes. And tell Terry what happened. I think the ingots turned out to be brass. Okay. And whatever happened after that, I don't recall. You remember flying in there? It was getting dark. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was awfully dark. Oh, I was just thinking the other night about the... Uh, bar that we went to and the motel we stayed in. Yeah. Yeah, that bar had a lot of a lot of good storytellers. 
I would imagine that town had a lot of a lot of treasure hunters, a lot of story hunters, a lot of stories, a lot of yeah. I would imagine. Has anybody able ever been able to get into to Victoria Peak? Just the government, and they've they closed it down. And you know, after Terry Delonis got a kick at the can, I think they gave him thirty hours or some stupid. Well, they gave him they gave him a lot of time, but he had to pay, and they charged him an, an, an enormous amount of money, and he ran out of funds and nothing flat. So you know, he had a long time, but he ran out of funds. Oh, and, I see. And that's how they they got him off of there, is because he they didn't charging pay. him. A, a lot of money per day and for for stuff that they didn't realize is going to have to pay for and they Terry figured that that they was charging him more than they should have so he took him to court and then they uh, anyways you know how do you win the government in court you know <laughs> they got more money and more lawyers than you so do you remember any of the secret service guys that were milling around the only guy is i remember are are involved in a different deal that was uh, Secret Service and ATF guys out of L.A. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember their names. Mm -hmm. Okay. All the time, you went down to uh, Socorro at least a dozen times over a two or three year period, Ken. What was your conclusion after all of that time? Unless you just stopped in Vegas and had a girlfriend, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, my conclusion on Victoria Peak that was a the government, i.e. Nixon and others, had taken that everything that there was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I ever show you some of the artifacts they purported to have? Oh, golly. Or do you remember? There's a sword and some jewels and a breastplate. No, I, I don't remember. Yeah, they showed me those, so, you know, I saw them. Oh, what about, one time I went down there, I went with Brent Bauer. Okay. I don't know if that's any help. Well, Brent's dead, isn't he? I have no idea. Yeah, he should be, if he's not. <laughs> he was a dandy, wasn't he? Well, that's it? probably true of all of us. Yeah, it is true. We're all uh, getting our turn right away. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, Brent, I haven't, I haven't even heard that name for 15 years. He, he was sure a mover and shaker. Who was Brent's partner, so to speak? Oh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I don't remember, but I, I remember he had a partner, and he was a, a guy that we had dealings with. So most of the time... Boy, most of boy the, guys, you're, you're brushing away a lot of straw on this old head. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I can gather that. So most of the trips, when you went there, you just uh, hung out trying to find out what was going on, or did you actually... Uh, attempt to get on the base with some of the guys. I attempted to go on the base by myself. Mm -hmm. And what happened? I never got any place. Did you have visitors stop you? Yeah, I had base security stop me. Well, we sure spent a lot of time and energy on that project. Oh, yes. And, and came up very empty on the whole thing. It was just tragic. And every every uh, move we made seemed to be thwarted by some unforeseen circumstance. Gosh, I haven't even thought of it for years and years. Yeah. 
Yeah, I haven't either. Terry got a hold of me, and and uh, I was lucky. I've got a file and a big box somewhere, and I can't find it uh, with all the history of that thing and the contract and everything that we were involved in. But I can't locate it. And my memory is failing also, Ken. I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit, Ken. <laughs> it is. Well, Ken, I'm going to let you go. and I don't think Ken really wants to remember some of the things that went on. Uh, one of the things that went on is we did fly in there with a chartered plane, and I brought an attorney, and we were to pick up some ingots, and we were greeted by, uh, when we went to get the ingots, we were greeted by a whole bunch of lights suddenly turned on. It was We flew, landed in the dark, and it wasn't on an airstrip. We landed on a piece of dirt road, and lights came on, and it was government officials, and uh, we actually got involved in a little uh, confrontation with shootouts over uh, over that, and we actually exited uh, very rapidly without any ingots. So they so they knew you was coming then. Somebody they, tipped them off that you was coming. You had a a, a place where you was going to uh, meet. And somebody tipped them off and said something. That's exactly it. We were greeted and, and we were told to come in at dusk. And I think the reason was so that we couldn't fly out because it certainly wasn't a lit runway. It was yeah. Lit. And we went ahead and uh, jumped out of the plane and, and you know, they told us to put our hands <coughs> up. And we didn't know if it was the uh, Secret Service or that's who I think it was. And... Uh, we didn't know it could have been banditos. Yeah, you, you know. Didn't know. So, was... Yeah, so we jumped back in the plane and flew out of there. And we had, when we got back uh, to the uh, to wherever we landed, uh, we noticed that there were some holes in the fuselage. Really? Yeah. So, so they hit the plane as it left, and and we all had guns at the time, and we shot back, which was probably not too clever. No, but if you don't know who they are, they didn't identify themselves. They no. just turned on lights and start ordering you around. And when you didn't, when you jump back in the plane, they just start shooting, huh? Yeah, and I wow. think I think Ken that had to be scary. Yes, I think Ken didn't want to remember that, and he had a gun too. But later on, later years, Ken uh, was uh, working very closely with the FBI on a lot of things, and I'm not so certain that he wasn't working with the Secret Service during that period of time also. But uh, Ken was a dear, dear friend, but he he had some uh, allegiance aberrations. <laughs> but we, uh, we, we got out of there. We, I felt very lucky to escape. Yeah, really? Yeah. And, so, uh, so whoever had you coming in, you think they was in cahoots with the military or Secret Service or whatever, and they wanted to stop people from trying to get the gold out, or or you, what? What do you? What are your thoughts on what happened there? My thoughts are that we flew in there at dusk as agreed and it was a strange time to go in and they said they wanted to do it under cover of darkness and that that concerned me and ken had made those arrangements and as i recall herman philpot was was uh, his liaison for that uh event that part of the adventure but when we uh left we uh you know got the hell out of there and and uh, David Day, as I recall, was the attorney that I took down there. Richard Day, not David Day, Richard Day. And uh, he was terrified when we left. And Yeah, I think I've been <laughs> super terrified. I bet he was terrified. Yeah. And uh, I was too. And I, I remember that, uh, you know, I had Ken come over to the house and... and guard the house for some days thereafter but uh so 
was you supposed to bring cash and you're supposed to trade cash for the bars or do you already give cash or do you think these guys were just trying to steal your cash or well I brought the attorney to do a contract so we try to get away with the gold and we were buying it as Dory bars uh -huh. and I had a briefcase of cash and uh, I can't remember how much money I had in cash but it was probably $50,000 cash which at that time was a lot of money yeah and they were they were to deliver so many ingots. When we got there, uh, there was no delivery. It was a they, so, they, 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 yeah. They didn't even pretend to uh, make delivery. So, Matter of so fact, they, the 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 plane we were fortunate enough not to turn the engine off the plane. We just let it idle while I got out and saw what it was all about. So then are you sure it was the military? Are you sure it wasn't these people that had a setup for you just to get your cash? You don't know really who that was. I have no idea. You just know that you get no shot idea. at. I, I thought it was either the military or Secret Service. The vehicles, one of the vehicles I saw clearly was a Jeep. Uh huh. And it looked like an army type Jeep. It wasn't a civilian uh, Cherokee or something like that. It was an army type Jeep, which could be anybody. But uh, we left in a hurry. So is this something that was was uh, originated through Ovanos, or is this some other dealings that you found? Some side, other th these were all side deals. And, this is side deals. Yeah, Ovanos did tell us uh, where to go to find part of the treasure that Doc Noss purportedly buried while he was trying to get it out of the reservation. And uh, that those places were inside the reservation. The military base? Yes, yeah. and, and uh, one of the locations she told us about was off the base. And Ken was supposed to find that one, and that was the main reason he was there. And I'm surprised he has forgotten some of the things. But well, he said, and I think you said he had a stroke, and so he, he had three that, strokes. So, so that, yeah, you lose a lot of your brain when that happens. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised he remembered Herman's name, but he did. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that was it, and we had. Uh, I went there later and tried to get the stories from some of the some of the. Uh, prospector types who hung out at this one saloon. This one saloon was the focal point of all the action and everybody drank there every night yeah. lied to each other and it was a, a source of all kinds of fun information. Not that it was real, but right. everybody had a story and the military would come into that saloon also and tell you know what they had seen out really? on the base. So it was a it was some intelligence that may have been valid, but there was no way to really determine. Verify, yeah. Yeah. So, so Ken said that he seen um, he was taken blindfolded into a cave with some um, look could have been gold, maybe it could have been brass. Looked like the shape of gourds um, with some armor in it, Spanish armor. Things like yeah. that, that had been cool to see. Did he, he talk to you about that? He did. Seen? Yeah, he did, and we made well, it. What did he say to you about that story? Well, when, when I got the story back, it was on top of a bunch of other stories from Ken, and I was I took it with a grain of salt, except he was pretty, he really believed it. He, and, yeah. and he was afraid when he had been blindfolded that they were going to kill him. That's what he was afraid of. Ah. And so I, I believed his story, and I had known Ken for years, and he'd always been very honest right, with me. Right. And he's one of, he was one of my best friends, so yeah. Yeah, I did believe him, and and we were never able to relocate the the cave. And Herman kind of disappeared in the desert every time we wanted to have a serious conversation with him, and we wanted to have those. And I, it's, 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 uh, with all the scuttlebutt, you know, I, I don't necessarily believe that the seven cities of Cibola, Victorial Peak was really a connection, but I believe that there was certainly gold there and ingots and they were dory bars. Yeah, I believe because, that too. Because, uh, 
because I, I know I had one as a doorstop for many years, and I drilled it, had it tested, and it was 20% gold. The rest was copper and silver, but it was 20% gold. It weighed 38 pounds. Ah. It made a great doorstop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so he, Ken was saying that uh, you guys did get or bought or something, a bar, and it turned out to be brass. Yeah, yeah, we got it. We bought some bars later, you know, that, uh, you know, we were just loop scooped and molly whopped. We just, they were, de they just deceived us. And I sent Ken down with money and, and, uh, and he was supposed to have a uh, drill and have the drill holes assayed and he didn't. He got conned in and just given him the money, he brought the ingots home and they were, they were definitely brass. So I, I, I would imagine there, there, along with a little bit of truth going on down there, there was a lot of fraud. Uh, I think there was a lot of mischief. Going on, a lot of scams. A lot of mischief, and I think I, I bit bigger than anybody because I really paid ninety thousand dollars for the rights that I never received. Yeah. So I was scammed uh, right at the gate and. And I always felt that we would get our money back from uh, all this promise to show us the cash that was of uh, ingots that was off the reservation. So I don't know that Ova really knew where that cash was because Doc moved it uh, with a guy named, I don't know if you see my video with Tony Jolly. No. So Doc moved it uh, because he was afraid that the guys he was dealing with were going to scam him, take 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 the gold and not pay him and and, and right. do away with him. So he 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 enlisted the help of a guy by the name of Tony Jolly, and they moved it all in the middle of the night. And then that morning, Doc Noss got killed. Yeah. And the only person that knew where that was 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 uh, Tony Jolly. And he later on went and found ten of the bars. I think there was ninety bars total, mm -hmm. maybe a hundred and something, like hundred and ten, right. hundred and ten gold bars, I think. Um, he later found 10 of them, but he talked, and, and when they went in, Terry Delanus, uh, uh, Dr. Oren Swearingen, and the rest of them, when they got Tony there, and they, they started casing it out, trying to figure out exactly where uh, Tony Jolly had been, they found, they finally found the area, and they found three uh, empty holes, uh, just as Tony had described how they put them, laid them in and everything, he, they found them, but they was empty. So somebody had beat them to it. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, the, the Noss family never got any of that. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a remarkable but, story. Yeah, but they never knew any of that until the the late nineties. You know, mm -hmm. so the time you was looking at it, looking uh, for it, they. They, and I don't know when them bars was re retrieved, if it was in the 70s or 80s or I, think, you know? I think Jolly, I think Jolly uh, was still alive at that time. Yeah, he was alive in the, and, in the 90s. He's and, passed away now. but And uh, we met with Jolly. Oh, because he, he said he talked to some other people about that, and they wondered if some of these other people that he talked to didn't go out and find this stuff. Okay, well, we talked to him, and Ken Ken was uh, in communication with Jolly okay. quite a bit because I remember uh, meeting Jolly, okay. and Ken introduced me in Truth and Consequences. So uh, Jolly was down there with Ken, and Ken made many trips there, not two or three. Yeah. He would go for two to three weeks at a time. Yeah. And he was, uh, he'd just undergone a, a bad divorce and he wanted to leave town and so yep. it was perfect for him. Yeah. And uh, Jolly was one of the, uh, the people that uh, I met with and, and he was one that had purported to cash in some of the gold. Yep, and, and he did. And, his, and he also had a story of taking some to Mexico huh. and selling. So uh, where, you know, whether that's true or not, you know, I don't know, but we had a few scotches and lied to each other at a bar for quite a while, and I believed him. Yeah. And Ken was, uh, I believed him too, and Ken actually spent a lot of time with him. And Jolly was supposed to also help him find some of the ingots. And I think we even uh, paid uh, jolly some money to show Ken at one point. Ah, 
So okay. So we were milked pretty good over a period of time. It sounds like you was really milked. Pretty yeah, good. that's got to hurt. That's a lot of money. To oh, lose ninety thousand dollars. That's got to hurt. Well, for you and and that's just for the part that went to Olba. That's not cutting all the rest of it. No, either. no. I, it it was a hundred fifty thousand dollar hiccup. Wow. All over with. And I, th I think I got, uh, you know, a small amount out of that ingot that we had finally. But that was, you know, we only had one ingot that I ever saw. Ken may have seen some others, but I only saw one that had any gold in it. Yeah. So that's kind of my story. And, and uh, we chased the uh, seven cities of Cibola through the intellectual community and you know, learned what everybody else has learned in Spain, that uh, they really, uh, you know, were active in the area, and it, it could have been mines there that that literally were commercial even in those days. Right. So, so you went back to Seville, Spain to look up documents did, and send people got that yeah, information? Yeah. I, I didn't go personally. Right. Uh, when I was in the Bahamas, there. I sent some people over who were Spanish speaking, and <coughs> they found you some good information. And they found, and yeah, they found some good information, and and it wasn't a secret. I mean, it, we weren't the first people to have been there. Ah, <laughs> so you got copies of that, and I did at the time. Yeah, and I, there's, uh, I might even still have some. I have files on this stuff, and they've been. You know, wow. gone for forty years, thirty, yeah. 40 years. So it's hard to say where they went. Huh? Yeah, it is. It's it's. That'd hard. be cool to see that stuff. Yeah, uh, I had some great pictures of uh, the Nasas in Disneyland too. Oh, that'd be I'd cool. I'd love too. to. I'd love to find yeah, those now. That would be cool. And if I find those, I'll, I'll yes. share those with you. And, yeah, do that. Yeah. So uh, did you know Terry Delonis or, or? I met Terry. I met he Terry. Probably just a. I met Terry in Los Angeles, as a matter of fact, and Marvin Beckwith arranged for me to meet with him. And Marvin, Marvin uh, was uh, uh, a good friend of Jerry Timothy, who married Ken Burns' former wife. Ah, okay. So, and so that's how you met Marvin and got involved in the story in the first place. That's, it all came through, uh, through uh, actually... Uh, and this was in the early 70s? Yeah, Ken's <coughs> former wife, his boyfriend at the time. And that was uh, Jerry Timothy. And uh, Lorraine Timothy is still alive, very alert. And I'll ask her if she remembers anything about this. Yeah. Because <coughs> Jerry had a file on it too, because Marvin was always trying to raise money yeah, he the, was right there involved with Doc and everything. So yeah, yeah. and we uh, and we were involved with Marvin in the public company arena and did a lot of penny stocks, ah. of which Marvin uh, participated. And so you know he was always trying to raise money on this thing, and and I was the first one to really bite. Ah, big that yeah, I know. Yeah, big. Of. He did bite big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Well, I, I, I guess, you know, the, the, the lore of treasure, you know, just the excitement to see something like that, you know, is, is, oh, is exciting. It is. It is. Nothing uh, turns you on more than to find the unexpected yeah. bonanza, wherever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we have always been uh, looking at the mines, and now I'm down in Central America looking uh, in the jungle for artifacts so you know it's it, it gets in your blood and you like it you know <laughs> yep and uh it hasn't been all all without uh, success we i actually uh found the largest gold mine at one point in america and sold really? it really and it was called it was up in uh, okanagan county washington and it's called the crown jewel and i sold it to a couple majors and they mine it every day now and it's been a terribly lucrative thing but it costs 80 million to put it into production All right so it was an expensive adventure but it at the time was the largest gold mine in america cool 
So, so you was into finding mining properties and that right from a young age, and, oh, yes. and, and that's what you, you you still do that type of stuff. I, I guess do. And, I do. I had over thirty mining companies. Really, mining companies all over the, mainly the West. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, cool. And we still have a mill in Eureka, and. Uh, so they're just getting it ready to expand that area. I'm working for a company that's going to expand. Are you part of that expansion on that in your EK area? Who, uh, what company? Was? Brahma? Brahma, no. Huh. Uh, I'd like to know more about them. Yeah, we have uh, an interest in 7,000 uh, acres there in mining claims. Well, they're, they're just putting in, the, they're just going to be putting in the infrastructure for the for the mine, I don't know, you know, crushers, conveyors, I don't know what all. It's, it's, it's going to be a big job, I think. I don't know wow. how many hundreds of millions, um, and I don't know who which, owns the mine. Which mine is it? I, I, don't, I just know it's there by Eureka. Eureka, Nevada? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, ours is Eureka, Utah. Oh, in Eureka, Utah. Oh, I, I know, I know Nevada. the project okay. you're talking about. Okay. Now. Yeah, that is a huge project, yeah. and it's a gold-silver yeah. play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that is a, a huge open pit operation. Yeah, that's not us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, wrong, wrong yeah. Eureka. <laughs> yeah, wrong Eureka. Yeah, that's interesting. I was hoping. <laughs> okay. Well, look, Terry, if I get any additional I, information, I'll share it with you. And I, man, have, I, I appreciate what you have shared because okay. your story, you know, your part of the story hasn't been known. So, man, I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, so. yeah. Well, I tell you, you know, I spent time in the Bahamas chasing this thing out, and I tried uh, tried the, the Texas dance to see if Johnson had really stolen it, and I got into all kinds of mischief down there. I bet you did. <laughs> trying to unearth things. And, and then we had some of the military guys, uh, one of them, we, we ran him down, and he was in... Not Tripoli, but uh, Beirut, Lebanon. One of the guys was in Beirut, Lebanon, one of the soldier types. Really? And uh, we ran him down, and we learned uh, that, he, that he purported to have been part of the theft of the gold. And the story that that we got from that group, and and I say group because I didn't go to Lebanon. I had had uh, some people over there that talked to him for me, and uh, but that they had actually taken the gold, and and he had his share, and he had cash, not gold. He, so he'd sold his, and and his source of money was the gold that came from Victoria Oak Peak, according to him, uh -huh. is what he told some of the other people. Naturally, when they found him, he was almost broke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it was many years later. Yeah. Well, John, man, I, I appreciate you taking the time <laughs> and sharing that with okay, me. And, well, and, and thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> and I'll sh share whatever else I find. Thank you. You're awesome. Thanks. Thanks.